want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I'd like to cover two topics, if I may. First of all, um, as the chairman of the local Republican Party, it's my duty and responsibility to support, and by the way, the same is true of my Democrat colleague, whoever our, our nominee happens to be. We all work intensively in the primary campaign supporting individuals that we think are the best nominee for the party, but once the voters speak, uh, we are duty-bound to, to support the ticket. As it happens, I was one of relatively few Republicans, uh, not only locally but also in the state, that were uh, active within the Republican Party that was a supporter of John McCain at the beginning. So I find that uh, probably I may be uniquely qualified to discuss that. In case you haven't read the newspapers, that wasn't the most popular thing to do, even though John McCain uh, won comfortably the Florida primary with a, a good-sized plurality. Uh, that point of view was not represented in the rank and file of Republican Party activists. On my executive committee, for example, there's 152 members. Three of us uh, supported John McCain out of 152. So you can get some idea. And that's probably about, about the spread throughout the rest of the Republican Party in the state. Um, the reason, by the way, is the same reason, the reason that uh, relatively few rank and file Republicans supported him is why many of us believe that John McCain has by far the best chance of any possible Republican nominee to win the White House, and that is because uh, many of his points of view um, are very much um, independent-minded. He's known as a maverick. That isn't just a label, and it isn't an unfair label. It's a favorite one. Um, in fact, if you have to talk to rank-and-file party activists, the three reasons that they give you most frequently for not voting for John McCain as Republicans are the three names of the bills for which he is most famous, namely uh, McCain-Feingold, McCain-Kennedy, and McCain-Lieberman, all of which were named after three prominent Democrats on three subjects that have been fairly unpopular within the Republican Party, specifically campaign finance reform, immigration, and global warming, all of which uh, are areas in which John McCain takes positions that have been at one time or another and probably still are um, contrary to the majority view within the Republican Party. I happen to think, by the way, that that's why he's likely to win the presidency, because a great many uh, independent-minded Democrats, conservative Democrats, moderate Democrats, and a lot of independents in the center recognize that uh, the country faces truly enormous challenges in 2009, starting with the new presidency, and that the idea that one party or the other can lecture the other side uh, is quickly becoming obsolete. And you've got to have a president and a Congress, for that matter, that are capable of working across the aisle. Our problems are in absolutely enormous. And this is a good segue into what I think the next president ought to be doing. Um, I remain a Republican. I'm a fairly unusual Republican for a lot of, in a lot of ways because I come from a fairly libertarian perspective. I'm primarily Republican for economic reasons some law and order reasons, um, pro-defense and the like. Um, I'm not a social conservative, as are many, um, many Republicans. Uh, I do not represent the majority view within the Republican Party either. But I must say that the problems that face us, the ones that will, uh, that will significantly impact your lives in the future, um, have relatively little to do with social issues. They may excite you. Um, they may cause you to get on picket lines and, and send emails. But the ones that will impact your daily life from the time you get up in the morning to the job that you take to how much money you have to support yourself to raising your family to the opportunities you have in the future are almost entirely economic. And one of the realities that, that we have to adopt, we have to understand as a nation, um, and probably the single most important reality, is that for all of this nation's history, our economic policies were substantially self-contained. Um, either uh, when we were a small power, we had almost no interaction with the international economic community, or as we became a larger power in the second half of the 20th century, our economic power was such that we essentially dominated the world economy. So we had internally the luxury of making decisions about our economic future based solely on our own economic and in internal economic concerns. If we wanted an interest rate so-and-so, we could set that interest rate. If we wanted to tax at a particular level, we could set a tax level, and the implications were primarily limited to our own country. And whether you were a very conservative voter or a very liberal voter, whether you felt that the government taxed too highly or, or didn't tax enough, whether you felt that other social programs should be paid for or not, the consequences 
and the ability to make those decisions was largely self-contained. We could do that as a nation. Those days are gone forever. And I don't think that either the Republicans or the Democrats fully understand that we no longer con entirely control our own destiny. What we decide to do to print money because we're fighting uh, deflationary trends or because we have to pump up the economy isn't entirely in our control any longer. If the Chinese don't buy our T-bills, that option's gone. If our interest rates are too low, the dollar collapses and we are unable to uh, sell our debt overseas. If we make decisions um, about taxation policy, the foreign capital that comes to this nation from the Chinas and the, and the Europe's of the world and the Japan's of the world will dry up. They can make a better interest return someplace else. They're not going to invest money in the United States. Those kinds of decisions, understanding the America's place in the world in 2009, are going to be critical to the next president. And we're living, for the most part, in a dream world if we believe that a president from either the right or the left, Republican or Democrat, has the flexibility to make those decisions without taking into consideration what investors and financial institutions and other governments around the world think about our economic decisions, which is why I believe that the first and foremost problem for the next president is going to be to understand the fundamental economic difficulties that our economy faces with respect particularly to budget deficits but also social And I think it's going to require a president like John McCain um, who has the ability to get in his car, drive up to the Capitol where he has worked with Democrats in the past historically, close the door with Harry Reid and not come out until they have a solution that potentially rescues Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security and balances our budgets going forward so that we can look to the international community and say our economic house is in order, the United States is a good place to invest, we have a future. Um, that's what I think is the predominant issue um, of our day. Uh, we can also talk, if you'd like, about uh, international economic policies. Clearly, that's, the two are very closely intertwined. Most economic decisions are based on self-interest. Um, if somebody overseas has a choice of making an investment in a T-bill that's 6% in a country they don't like very much versus 5% in a country they think is wonderful, they'll probably still take the 6%. So would you if it's your money and it's your future and it's your investment opportunity. But nonetheless, um, <clears> how <throat> food gives us options in other ways as well. And I, I would say, that, submit to you that those two considerations, getting our economic house in order so that we've got a fiscally responsible nation to lead, um, and uh, how we deal with the rest of the world are critically important. I was delighted to see that John McCain made a speech the other day, uh, to some extent breaking with the current administration, saying, look, we've really got to look to our international allies for more guidance. And the days when we could afford to go it alone are essentially over. We've got to reach out and do that. Um, last point I want to make on the economic issues is that the great irony of the end of the Cold War is that um, for most of the allies of the ex-Soviet Union and arguably for large portions of the ex-Soviet Union itself, and for most of the socialist nations of the world, most of them have adopted what is essentially a free enterprise, free market, uh, highly capitalist system, which in many respects um, is more competitive than the system that defeated ours. Tax rates are frequently lower in the ex-communist nations. Government regulation is frequently lower. Um, economic decision making is frequently more rational. Budget deficits are lower. Social spending is lower. It's ironic that in, the, in, in winning the Cold War, we effectively converted most of the world to an economic system that is more specifically and rigorously capitalist than our own. The Chinese actually probably have better fiscal governance than we do, and it is still theoretically a communist nation. Think about it. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm Dick Batchelor. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't mean to knock it over, didn't. I think it's rather interesting, Lou, about what you talked about, because when you today go and fill your car up with gas, you're looking at gas somewhere over $3, and in Europe now, for the same thing, it's about 7 to $8. Uh, you look at your retirement account, your IRA, your family's IRA, and it looks like somebody's gone over with a hacksaw. Really, really down. You look at the fact we're spending $12 billion a month in Iraq, and are we making any progress uh, over there? And you look at the deficit, which is just astronomical now, 
And in fairness, you have to step back and say, okay, how did that happen? Well, for the majority of the last number of years, the Republicans have controlled the House and the Senate and the presidency. And these issues were there, and somehow or another, they didn't get resolved. Uh, you can point your finger one way or the other, but the bottom line is that these issues did not get resolved. I think the one thing Democrats have going is the fact that they're going to win the U.S. Senate. The question is, will they get 60 seats or not? And 60 is the magic number, because if you have 60, you can cut off debate. Uh, they're going to win the House of Representatives. More Republicans have retired now than uh, any time in, in, since my involvement in the Congress over 40 years. There are a lot of open Republican seats, and as Lou knows, it's very hard. To, it's harder to defend an open seat than it is a seat where you have an incumbent. The incumbents generally do pretty well. So we've got the chance in 09 to have a legislature that is totally Democratic, and with the president that's Democratic, we will be able to move issues. Everybody talks about checks and balances. Checks and balances are good, but when you have these issues that are staring you in the face, you've got to do something about them. For instance, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, if nothing is done in around 35 years, it'll take up over 70% of the budget. That means there's no money for education, there's no money for the space program, there's no money for defense. It's going to happen unless the Congress is able to do something, unless the Congress is willing to step forward and take, for instance, those three issues on. Talk about immigration is one of the problems. We have somewhere between 12 and 20 million illegal immigrants in the country, and every year we add to it. We had a symposium I was fortunate enough to attend here, and some congressmen, Republican congressmen, pointed out that it was costing us $45 billion a year to handle the illegal immigrant problem. And that issue has to be addressed. It's just bouncing along and it isn't going anywhere. And finally, we've got to figure out what we want to do internationally. As a Democrat, I was against uh, going into Iraq. And once we were there, I think like most people, I've supported the troops. I think that's primary. And the main difference between now and in Vietnam, which was my era, is that you don't get spit on when you come home. You get applauded when you walk through the airports. People care about the troops. I just got back teaching Norwich University, which is the oldest military private school in the country. 1,200 young men and women who go into the officer corps. Uh, wonderful young people, dedicated young people. And by the way, ask them about the, uh, the draft and said, what if we res want to restore the draft? And they said, no. They said, in no way do we want to draft. We don't want to be in a foxhole next to somebody who doesn't want to be there. So, of course, that's from a group of people who are going in, but it's certainly an interesting, interesting viewpoint. But we have one other major issue that I think as Democrats we're going to have to take on, and that's the energy issue. In 1973, we were importing less than 30 percent of our oil. Today, we're importing 60 percent of our oil, and it's going to continue to grow. What would happen if all of a sudden the oil was cut off? What would happen to our economy if the oil reaches $200 a barrel? Uh, the worst part is, to a great extent, right now, because of the inability of the Congress to act, and, and I'll be fair on this, it was the Congress, not just the Democrats or Republicans, we have no national energy policy. None. We have bits and pieces of it, but we don't have any national energy policy. Unless we can get together uh, as a country and move towards that, our foreign policy and our economic policy is going to be controlled by countries such as Saudi Arabia. And that is not a good thing. So when we look at the office and running for it, I think as Democrats, we have a lot going for us. And as a Republican, we've got a lot to overcome, have to overcome the economy. What was it Clinton said? It's the economy, stupid. Uh, and it is the economy. We have to un understand and hope that the Republicans do that Iraq works out well, that the recent problems in Basra, you know, go away and the country continues to move. So 
What is it the Republicans are going to have to talk about? Change? I think the Democrats have taken over that issue, at least they've certainly talked about it enough. And it should be an, an interesting camp, campaign. One thing I would suggest is that the campaign between John McCain and either Senator Clinton or Senator Obama is probably going to be a lot more reasonable and a lot less, lot less strident than the campaign between Hillary Clinton and Obama. And uh, as a Democrat, what I want to have happen is I want somebody to win. You know, at this point, I think I want somebody to win more than I care who wins because the longer it goes, the longer it goes, the more the Democratic Party is has a, has a chance, at least, of being torn apart and leaving people who won't vote. Somebody who's angry because Senator Obama didn't get it or somebody who's angry who Senator Clinton didn't get it. I, I played ball most of my life and baseball and that. Matter of fact, my grandson played against uh, your school about a week ago, a couple weeks ago, and had uh, two doubles against you. He's, a, he's the only ninth grader playing uh, varsity. But anyway, you know, you need the breaks. The Republicans need the breaks in order to win. Is it possible? Yeah. Uh, where's President Gore? How that election, how we lost that election, I'll never know. So it can happen, but certainly it's ours to lose. I think that's fair, and I think that's what you'll find that many of the political prognosticators are saying it's ours to lose, and uh, it's possible we could lose it. Um, so that's it from the Democrat side. There is one thing I do want to say, and, I, and, and it's very difficult to stand up here. My uh, part-time roommate in the Navy was shot down August 22nd in 1965 and went immediately to the Hanoi Hilton, was there two and a half years before John got there. And when uh, Senator McCain was released from prison, he was stationed at Cecil Field in Jacksonville. And because of my roommate and the connection, I was in Navy too, aviation, he called and I have known him literally since 1973. And I happen to personally respect uh, and admire him, uh, just so you know. But uh, on the other hand, that doesn't change what I said. He's got a very difficult campaign and a lot of obstacles to overcome. Uh, a day in politics is a lifetime. There are a lot of days left, but, uh, and, and who knows, this has been the wildest year I've seen in a long time. So thank you for letting me express as best I could. Mr. Dick Batchelor, done much better, but I tried my best. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your early support for John McCain became, uh, came about because of his uh, bipartisanship, where he's crossed the aisle several times but you're also a Republican because of conservative economic ideas. Are you concerned that um, he may be forced into a more bipartisan um, economic program that pulls him away from original conservative economics? It's a, good, it's a really good question. The answer is n not really because, uh, honestly, there is, there is no long-term solution to our most critical economic problems that isn't bipartisan, N neither party. Um, Lou Fry said it, said it correctly that the, the really big issue, um, if you take your eye off the presidential election for a moment, if you think or if you'd like to vote for a Democrat or if you think the Democrat is likely to win the presidency, the next most important thing to look at is what happens in the United States Senate. Because as long as there are at least 41 members of the minority party, they can block any particularly offensive legislation through a filibuster, as you probably have heard about. And you need 60 U.S. senators to, to stop the filibuster. So essentially, um, the only way a political party in the United States, and, and, it, and not in my lifetime, has, I've, has any political party in my lifetime had control of the presidency plus the, the House of Representatives plus 60 votes in the United States Senate. Um, arguably, when you reach that level, um, you achieve as close as we get in this country to a, a democratic dictatorship because you literally can do anything you want. It doesn't matter. The, the minority party loses the ability to block even the most extreme positions that, that you would like to take. So um, it's very clear. Uh, even the wildest, most wildly optimistic Republicans has no expectation that Republicans are going to capture back the United States Senate uh, or for that matter, the House. If we're lucky, we'll hold on to the margin that we have in the Senate, maybe pick up a seat in the best case scenario, which would still put us in a minority in the Senate. 
And the best case in the House is to pick up 10 or 15 seats, which still puts us in the minority. That's the best case scenario. So any president, Republican, Democrat, they're going to have to work with the other side of the aisle. And, you know, it's, it, it, to my way of thinking, um, there's an old expression that perfection is the enemy of a good result. And if you demand your own way 100% of the time, all of it, you're not going to achieve anything because the other side isn't going to buy into it. Um, the other reason, by the way, that I think that John McCain, I, I listed one of the main reasons, which is the ability that I think, he's the, I think he's the only guy in the entire country, I think he's literally the only human being who can practically pick up a phone, call Harry Reid, with whom he has worked in the past, or call Nancy Pelosi, look, I don't believe in personal attacks, I'm going to get in my car, I'm going to drive up to the Capitol, get a bunch of uh, candy bars and Cokes, lock the door, and we're not coming out until we've hammered out a solution that both sides can agree to. You're going to take some pain, we're going to take some pain, and the like. I won't, I won't love the solution. There won't be a Republican in the country that will love the solution. There won't be a Democrat in the country that will love the solution. But as long as we hate them equally, and, and the general public hates them equally, then we will have a potential solution to our national problems. And I personally believe John McCain, is, as, a, as an individual, is absolutely the only person who, with the credibility and the gravitas and the experience and, um, and the goodwill, to be able to accomplish that. Put you down as undecided. I think from a Democrat standpoint, one of the biggest dangers that I see in the campaign is John McCain is willing to be a one-term president. And I think it's a real danger from uh, our standpoint. Because if you're willing to take on the third rail of politics, social security, you know you're not going to get reelected. If you're willing to take on immigration uh, and come up with a compromise which nobody's going to like, you know you're not going to get reelected. If you're willing to put a national energy policy together, it means that we'll drill in Alaska. The drilling will come in off the Florida coast closer because everybody's going to have to pay a burden for it. We're going to have to have nuclear power. We're going to have to come up with more conservation issues. Everybody's going to have to pay a price. And you know, if that happens, everybody's going to be angry with you. Now, who's willing to do that? Uh, and uh, I think that, that McCain is, is willing to do that. I think it's one of his strengths, and uh, it could become an issue in the campaign. It's not clear yet uh, to us, and of course the superdelegates may decide this or may not, of uh, whether Senator Obama and Senator Clinton uh, are going to be willing to take those issues on. I hope they will. I believe they're going to, but uh, that is one of the few chinks I think we have in our armor. I, I want to say as a quick follow-up that one of the myths that we have about ourselves as Americans, this is, and this is truly a myth, you ought to think about it yourself, is that we have this idea of our national character that we love, that we yearn for somebody to tell us the things that we don't want to hear, that we desire courage in politics. That's a load of horse crap. Um, what we really want is for somebody to tell the other guy things that they don't want to hear. We don't ever want to be told what we don't want to hear, ever. Um, or rather, a, a relatively small minority of us do. One of the reasons I, I, I really love, personally, really believe John McCain is a solution is because the guy waltzes into Iowa and says, look, you guys are hardworking farmers. You're the backbone of America. I know that the backbone of the economy is ethanol, but it's stupid, and I'm not supporting it. I, not to win the presidency, not to win the nomination, nothing. Not doing it, sorry. He walks into to, uh, Michigan where he's just come out of a victory in, in New Hampshire. And all he has to do is say, you know what, I'm going to get back your $50 an hour screwdriver turning jobs in Detroit. I'm going to bring the automobile industry back to Detroit. All he has to do is say that. And instead he says, look, let's be honest, those jobs are never coming back. Not now, not ever. Let's, let's go to plan B. Let's figure out what else we can do. And he loses in Michigan. Then he comes to Florida. He's got to win Florida to win the presidency. What does the, what does the, the Florida congressional delegation and the governor want more than anything? a national catastrophic event fund where the federal government bails out Florida if we have a hurricane. And John McCain says, I know I need Florida, I know I love Charlie Crist, I know these are my friends down here, but that's a stupid idea, it doesn't make sense for national policy, I'm not supporting it. I will not make that speech. And he wins anyway. That's the attitude of somebody, in, and he's exactly right, that's what Democrats ought to be afraid of because at the end of the day, the folks in the middle of the spectrum will buy into it, even if the Democrats on the far end and the Republicans on the far end hate him for it. 
there were a number of key issues that were mentioned, and they all are important, but one that was not, which I think is imperative to address, and that's the national debt. It's now going at an increasing rate that can't be sustained, and our children and grandchildren and theirs will be the ones paying for it. How are either of those parties going to address this? Well, I think from, from John McCain's perspective, he's got a, a long history of, you know, one of, one, of the things, one of the reasons he's very unpopular in Republican circles is because he voted against the president's tax cut the first time around, and he did so on fiscal conservative reasons. He said, look, I don't have a problem cutting taxes, but you've also got to cut spending. You can't cut just the taxes and not the spending, and that's why he voted against it. And, and a million Republicans were enraged having done so. He also attacked his own party repeatedly for earmarks. Those are those little games where the, where the uh, members of the House on both sides and of the Senate put their little chunks of money, sometimes 30, 40, 50 billion dollars a year of little chunks of money, into the budget in order to, to get their, their deals passed. So I think I, I would submit to you that Senator McCain is the only one who has taken on, you know, it's, it's really easy in politics to battle the other party. Everyone rewards you for that. You go to the dinners, you get great applause, all your friends love you, your colleagues in the house pat you on the back, that's wonderful. When you take on the people in your own party, there's nowhere to hide. That takes real courage. And John McCain has done that over and over again, which is one of the reasons why I think, for example, that Senator Obama is running under a, a fictional myth. The so-called post-partisan guy has a 10-year history in politics, which is uniformly partisan in every respect. There is no bill in the United States Senate. There is no bill in the Illinois legislature. There is no initiative at any level, anywhere, that has Obama's name on it with some Republican doing something that was unpopular in the Democratic Party. That's just a myth. It's a game. He has sold a bill of goods to the American public. John McCain has paid the price, has the history, has the track record, has done the work for two decades. And Obama has nothing but a series of slogans that the media has bought into. Not one single solitary achievement. Not one Republican who will stand on a stage with him. Never. No place. That's not the way you run the country. That's not how you solve the problems. That's not how you reach across the aisle and come up with a solution that everybody's going to buy into. Otherwise, we'll be squabbling for the next four years. I've uh, been personally invited. I, one of the first bills I introduced in the Congress coming from Florida was a bill to balance the budget. I think 47 states have a requirement to balance the budget. I didn't understand why, if it was good for 47 states, it wasn't good for uh, our country. And uh, a number of us, including Fallis from Florida and that, introduced it. Uh, we got it close, but we never could get it over the hump. And uh, I think it's not just a question of whether Senator Obama or Clinton will support it or Senator McCain will. I think it's a question of also of the congressional will, because a president doesn't spend a penny. A president can't spend a penny. penny. Read Article I of the Constitution. It's up to the Congress and specifically the House to have the courage to be able to do it. And everybody says, well, gee, you're spending it on defense. When I was first elected to the Congress, uh, we were spending 54.6% of our budget on defense. A lot of money. Majority of our money was going to defense. It's sunk down now to 30 some percent. In gross dollars, it's a big number. But the increase in the spending has been on the social programs, a lot of which I support, which are good. But we've got to get our hands around the programs. And I think it's really as much up to Congress as it is to whether it's a Democrat or a Republican president. Again, I go back to before. It's a question of survivability of our country. Our conventional wisdom has that well, whether there's a conventional or wisdom, of, at least by the press, that uh, uh, the Senator McCain's going to have to run away from his base, the conservative side. Yet you never hear anything about the, the Democrats running away from their base, the more liberal side. And I'm just wondering, you know, what will uh, either uh, Senator Obama or Senator Clinton have to do to move towards the center? Because uh, I guess 80 percent of the electorate has already uh, cast their, their votes one way or the other. So we're talking about a very small percentage, one way or the other, to swing the election. What are they going to have to do to change their positions or what will even Senator McCain have to do to change his position to get closer to the center to pick up that 20 percent? Well, the good, news, the good news for Senator McCain is that if you, if you separate the politics of speech making and of image from the politics of history, reality, and record, he doesn't have to do much of anything because his actual record in the United States Congress for 20 years is one of centrism. Um, he has been part of 
uh, trying to solve the most difficult problems. The, the immigration bill, for example, which was wildly unpopular with Republicans, he was one of the co-sponsors, along with Senator Ted Kennedy uh, of Massachusetts. Um, if you look at global warming, for example, rep uh, John McCain is the only Republican who has taken an aggressive position on global warming, believing that the United States ought to do more to comply with Kyoto and, 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 uh, and come up with a, an independent energy policy. So a lot of what's going on now in the media is, is a question of speech making and rhetoric. But when it comes down, when it comes time for people and voters to actually examine the record, I think it'll be clear that McCain has the hard bill of goods uh, by way of record. It's also important to note that one of the biggest trends in American politics in the last probably 20 or 30 years, and I think Lou will agree with me on this, is that larger and larger numbers of Americans are either registering as or identifying themselves as independents. And so, you know, to win an election, you can no longer afford to just hold your base and, and a small percentage of, of the independents. You have to appeal to a significant number of independents, and I think John McCain has a history of doing that in his own political races um, and has a history of doing that um, on the campaign trail and has a history of doing that also in the, uh, uh, in the primaries. I know that there's a lot of discussion about the vice presidency. I know on the Republican side is the, who it's uh, going to be, and I think you can see the way the candidates are thinking. For instance, uh, it's Republicans who probably won't be Huckabee. Uh, and the reason it won't be Huckabee is the Republicans think they don't need it, that Obama and Clinton will scare the hell out of their base enough to vote, despite all the complaining about uh, McCain. And on the uh, Democrat side, the same kind of thing. McCain is going to scare enough of the Democrats so that the labor unions, uh, the liberal part of the party, which is a very strong party, you know, is going to come out because McCain will scare them. Uh, that means that when you're looking at who's going to be the vice president from the Republican standpoint, uh, you need somebody, number one, who knows economics or is involved in it or somehow or another can, can help support McCain on, on the economics. Uh, you need somebody who is younger. Uh, and you probably, probably need somebody from the Midwest because when you start looking at the states and dividing them up and who's where and that, there are really not a lot of states that are going to be in flux uh, in the campaign. Uh, so uh, when you look at the Democrats and trying to find out who the vice president is, it's, it's somewhat the same. Uh, probably doesn't make a great deal of sense to have somebody from the southeast uh, there. Uh, you're going to win California, you're going to win New York, you're going to win all of New England. So why bother to get somebody from up there? So when you stop, start chopping it up, uh, again, you, you would like to have somebody like a Sam Nunn, uh, who many of you don't know, but Sam Nunn was a very respected senator from Georgia, member of the Defense Committee, a very solid, stable, a uh, little bit older, I think he's 69, and, and uh, that, would, that would argue against having somebody from the Southeast. But remember, a vice president really just does three things. Number one, they carry their own state. Number two, they don't screw up, say something dumb. I mean, and this, who knows, this time, you know, that's pretty hard to overcome. Uh, that's the second thing. And the number thing is, three thing is they fill a niche. The niche could be blue, black, pink, conservative, liberals, military, somewhat. And that's the three things you try and do with a vice president. So, that plays to what you're talking about, though. You're, you're not playing to either side in this. You're trying to get 11% of the 20. It really comes down to that, and, and you hope the vice president will, will help you and uh, not hurt you. The only thing in my lifetime that it made a difference is, is Lyndon Johnson was the most powerful member of Congress, member of the Senate, in, our, you know, in, in years and years and years. He did not like John Kennedy. He disliked John Kennedy. He thought John Kennedy was incompetent and on and on and on. And he ran as John Kennedy's vice president. And without Johnson on the ticket, they'd have lost Texas and Nixon would have won. So, you know, there is a possibility that we can get Obama uh, to run with Clinton or Clinton to run with Obama. Because if Kennedy and Johnson can be on the same ticket, anything goes. But, um. I've, uh, I've got a real quick one for you. I've, I've got a, um, my father lives here in Orlando and uh, he's a registered Republican. And uh, he uh, will not vote for John McCain. And uh, not because of his uh, moderation, but he, said he, he says he's too old. He's around the same age as my dad and my dad, well, I can't make it all day without a nap. And uh, I don't think he can either. 
and he says uh, he's worried about his experience as a prisoner of war that he's a little bit off uh, off the wall. That's where that's that's the real position. That's and he's one of those guys that we that everybody's trying to court, court right? He's an actual swing voter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, registered Republican voter, Republican <coughs> more than Democrat, but this time he says he's voting Democrat. What do you have to say? Well, <clears throat> you know, there's a few things in politics you can fix and a few things that you can't. And one of them is your birth certificate. Uh, is the you can't fix that one. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is that John McCain and I've met her campaigns with his 96-year-old mother. Uh, they don't wheel her in, in a wheelchair. She walks in under her own power. She gives speeches. Um, she gives interviews. Uh, she's pretty darn cogent at the age of 96. Um, think about that for, for a moment. Um, also, uh, John McCain has pretty good, you know, uh, pretty good bill of health. Um, there are a lot of folks in American politics on both sides of the aisle who actually think that John McCain's political views on a lot of subjects from ranging from immigration to uh, global warming to others are the most sane of, of any, uh, any candidate anywhere. Um, and the folks who have known John McCain for his whole life will tell you that uh, his personality was not one whit different um, before uh, five and a half years in a North Vietnamese prison camp as it was afterwards. So there's little or no indication you go through a battery of tests. When he came back from Hanoi, for example, he continued to serve as an officer in the United States Navy finished out a fairly distinguished career as a naval officer. He w went through a series of psychological tests. Um, uh, the press follows him around, as you can imagine, uh, like little terriers every single second of the day. John McCain does not take naps in the middle of the day. They know that. That's not, it's not him saying so. It's because he's literally accompanied from the time he gets up in the morning until the time he goes to bed at night, and in many ways works harder. And in fact, I think the, the national press has agreed that he spends more on the campaign trail, does more events, works harder, and spends more time on his feet than do his Democratic opponents or any of his Republican opponents for that matter. Um, so I, I think that in the end, uh, when the American public sees him on the campaign trail, they're going to be satisfied with, uh, with his performance. Um, neither of you have commented on the possibility of a universal health care system in America. So I was just wondering what you two view the pros and cons of a multi-payer system. But we've got an hour left and we take up the next panel. Let's see if we can keep it to 30 seconds or so. Briefly, there are 45 million Americans in the middle. Uh, those that aren't as wealthy have Medicare. Those that are doing better off have the, have the uh, different kinds of health insurance plans. But there's a whole bunch of people sitting in the middle who need it. There's two approaches to it. One is to use the free enterprise system to let the people get bundled together, all the small business people to, to do that and that. And the other way is uh, to provide government funding. Uh, Senator Obama suggested government funding. Uh, the numbers are pretty astronomical, but if we cut down in, in, in Iraq, we may be able to do it. So it's a difference of philosophical approach. Um, I would say that the single greatest threat facing the nation's long-term future is getting a handle on social spending and, and programs related from Medicare, Medicare, Social Security, and the like. Um, adding national health insurance to the mix essentially guarantees the economic destruction of the nation. John McCain's proposal, I think, is more rational. Go to a, a system that allows individuals to make individual purchases in the marketplace on a competitive basis and provide a tax credit on income taxes so that individuals can afford it that they can only use to purchase the health insurance and then let the market solve the problem rather than have the federal government step in and, and assume yet another burden um, in a national economy where the burdens are already killing us. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Uh, just one last thing I, I you know I hate stereotypes I hate when people talk about conservative or liberal or black or blue or pink or whatever I, I, I really don't like stereotypes and I think they're one of the problems today of our society and of our politics people try and put labels on the other on somebody else and that and I think what your dad was talking about is stereotype because you know I still run an hour a day and then work out with weights for about 45 minutes a day uh, and uh, I'm approaching John's age, and I still work about a 16-hour day. So I think it's an individual thing. I know some friends of mine who we can't play a set of tennis because they're too damn fat. Uh, <laughs> my closest friend, who was an All-American goalie at Harvard, you know, uh, it, it really. It, it, and I think people take care of themselves differently. They have different constitutions and that. So I think whether it's McCain or Obama in his youth or, or Hillary, Whatever I think, judge people on, on what they are, not on some stereotype, because uh, everybody's an individual, everybody's different. Uh, I think we have an obligation to do that. 
All right, we are out of time. Thank you, folks. <laughs>